Welcome everyone. My name is Madeline No, and I'm with NetHope and we'd like you to welcome you to another NetHope Solution Center webinar. Today, we're, uh, our topic is the launch of USAID and NetHope's updated toolkit for using digital payments in programs. And today we're uh, welcoming presenters from USAID, Strategic Impact Advisors, and NetHope member organization, Management Sciences for Health. Before we get started with our presentation today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping guidelines for the session. Please keep it interactive. We wanna hear from you. Please put your comments and questions in the Zoom chat window for our Q&A discussion toward the end of the hour today. Please also look for a follow-up email that will include a link to the recording and the collateral from the session that will be posted on the NetHope Solution Center. And we ask you to provide your feedback after the session is done today. Please take a, a couple of minutes to complete our webinar satisfaction poll that will be presented after the webinar. And with that, I will hand things off to Tala Amadi from Strategic Impact Advisors to kick off the session. Tala? Thank you, Madeline. And hello and welcome everyone to the launch webinar of the updated USAID NetHope Digital Payments Toolkit. As Madeline mentioned, my name is Tala Amadi. I will be your host for today. And I am also a project manager at Strategic Impact Advisors who led this toolkit update as one of the final projects under NetHope's cooperative agreement with USAID called the Global Broadband and Innovations Alliance, which concluded just recently in September of this year. I'm going to start by giving you some background about the toolkit. So it's actually an updated version from the first 2014 edition that USAID and NetHope created. That first edition focused heavily on guiding organizations through the digitization of operational payment streams. So typically involving staff payments, per diems, contractor payments, etc. Now this updated version guides USAID implementing partners, many of them, of course, which are NetHope members, on how to digitize their programmatic payment stream. So focusing more on the end user or the beneficiary of a program. So the toolkit is a 10 step journey using a human centered design approach to not only selecting the right digital payment product, but also, and, and perhaps more importantly, sustaining its active usage for the program and beyond. So the toolkit includes downloadable tools for every step that you can customize for your organization, as well as video tutorials, which guides readers through the the completion of more challenging tools. And that's a new feature for 2020. So the toolkit will be available soon um, to download from the NetHope Solutions Center, hopefully later today. And the link will also be emailed to you uh, with the recording for the webinar. So before we, we dive into the webinar and hear from our panelists, I wanted to highlight something that should be in the back of your mind as you read and use the toolkit, um, and also as you listen in today. So that is the crucial role development partners play in bolstering and supporting digital payment ecosystems, particularly in areas that lack access to formal financial services. So while of course there are some markets that are advanced enough uh, to offer a fairly seamless digital payment process, other markets require more work and more active collaboration with service providers. So as development partners and in USAID implementing partners, you may find that the most important work you can do in a, in a payment digitization program is not necessarily issuing the payments themselves, but actually supporting the sustainable growth and expansion of a digital payment ecosystem that can service your pays needs long after the program period. So this toolkit is, is really written from both perspectives. One, to successfully implement digital payments in your program, but secondly, and again, more importantly, um, how to ensure the program participants have now adopted digital payments as part of their financial lives. So with that said, I would like to introduce our panelists for today. We have Taha Gaya, who is the Digital Finance Advisor at USAID. We also have Craig Molinio, who is the CFO of Management Sciences for Health, which as Madeline mentioned, is a USAID implementing partner um, who also conducted a peer review of the toolkit. And lastly, but certainly not least, we have Shelly Spencer, who is the CEO of Strategic Impact Advisors and ran NetHope's digital payment work under uh, the Global Broadband and Innovations Alliance for nine years. So our agenda for today is to highlight four steps from the toolkit, and then Craig will come in to offer some practical examples of how these steps can be implemented and used by development partners. 
Now, without further ado, I will hand the mic over to Taha Gaya from USAID, who will give us an overview of how this toolkit is in line with USAID's broader digital strategy and also introduce us to step three. Taha, over to you. Uh, thanks, Tala. If we can get the next slide on the screen, that'd be awesome. Uh, so Tala, again, thanks for just a really excellent introduction into the content that we'll be covering today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, being here at USAID uh, to work with both you and with Shelly uh, at Strategic Impact Advisors and NetHope, uh, kind of on putting this toolkit together and updating it. Um, but this slide just kind of, is, is, the idea is to walk you uh, through uh, USAID's kind of digital payments journey. So Tala covered a lot of these points, um, but back in 2014, one of the first steps USAID took was to issue guidance in the form of a procurement executive bulletin uh, or a PEB mandating electronic payments. We now refer to them as digital payments as the default method of payment for all USAID awards. Uh, so many on the call will be familiar with this e-payments PEB or possibly as it shows up in section H of your awards. But we didn't wanna just issue this mandate without providing a helpful resource on how to actually adopt and implement digital payments. So we worked with NetHope, uh, and when I say NetHope, I mean Shelly and her team, uh, to develop the original e-payments toolkit and training. Uh, so that toolkit provided guidance primarily to implementing partner finance managers on how to identify and implement the right e-payment solution. Uh, and as Tala mentioned, the focus there was primarily on digitizing internal operational payment streams for things like salaries, per diems, travel advances, uh, and contractor and vendor payments. Uh, so fast forwarding now to 2020, as many of you know, USAID's first ever digital strategy was launched in April of this year. Uh, and the strategy's overarching goal is to achieve and sustain open, secure, and inclusive digital ecosystems that contribute to development and humanitarian assistance outcomes and increase partner country self-reliance. You might hear it as our journey to self-reliance kind of theme. Uh, but what does all of this mean for digital payments? So the digital strategy reaffirmed USAID's commitment to making digital payments the default method of payments under all USAID contracts and awards uh, with appropriate exceptions. So there's about nine exceptions uh, under, under the guidance uh, that you can kind of avail yourself of if you're in one of those situations. For example, if you're in a humanitarian situation where there's an immediate need to get cash out the door and it's a short-term program, uh, then you might be available to avail yourself of one of those exceptions. Um, but how do we get there? How do we get to digital payments by default in our programming? Uh, and we've launched two digital payment initiatives under the digital strategy that we're hoping will help. So the first of these initiatives is an update to the old 2014 NetHope ePayments Toolkit, which is hopefully what we're here uh, today to discuss. Hopefully I'm in the right place. Um, but we're also, again, you know, that, that toolkit was published in I think 2014. And so now it's six years later and we're hoping to update this new version uh, much more frequently than that. So as you're kind of start, as you as implementing partners and, and global development organizations start to use the toolkit, and as you have feedback for us on ways we can improve that, updates that we should be doing, things that weren't entirely clear, please definitely submit that feedback to us so we can continue to iterate uh, and improve on this toolkit. We don't want it to be just a static document, but really something that's a little bit more dynamic. Uh, so the second digital payment initiative is our landscaping assessment. And that's where we facilitated discussions with over 120 USAID implementing partner staff on digital payments. And so the purpose of those discussions was essentially a USAID listening tour where we were hoping to learn not just how you all are using digital payments, but also your motivations, your successes, your challenges, and most importantly, where we as USAID can help you uh, in terms of tools, resources, and updates to USAID policies and guidance around digital payments. And so we're looking to share the results of this assessment. As I said, we've, we've done, you know, we've met with over 120 uh, implementing partner staff, and we'll have the results of that assessment uh, kind of codifying and, and those, those results uh, early next year. So keep an eye out uh, for an invitation to that, uh, to that session. Uh, next slide, please. So turning now to the toolkit, we'll fast forward to step three, local partner support and payment stream, payment stream mapping. So this step, help, this step helps you map your payment streams to analyze where cash payments are being made 
in the cost benefit analysis of converting those cash payments to digital. So many of you often work with local partners on the ground who are the direct interface with program beneficiaries. So for example, working with an agribusiness to digitize smallholder farmer payments. Your local partners may be the ones making the direct payments to, pro to program beneficiaries. While here we recommend your or your local partner's finance staff read and work through this section. This section goes through both operational and programmatic payments. So it would be good to draw in your program staff as well. The toolkit goes into this later, but it's useful to think about what happens next. So what happens after your payees receive a digital payment? Once your payees have digital funds, do they just immediately cash out? Or are there ways for them to extend the value and convenience of digital payments? So this is going to the kind of digital ecosystem concept that Natala kind of mentioned in her introduction. So for example, working if you're working with agricultural, you could work with agriculture input suppliers to accept digital payments. So smallholder farmers who are now receiving digital payments from an agribusiness can in turn use those digital payments to pay for fertilizer or other kind of agricultural inputs. So you're kind of completing that circle, right? So your payees get the digital payments, then they have places that they can then use it because you've worked with those uh, vendors also. Uh, there are two tools for this step, the payment scoping survey tool and the costing utility analysis tool. So the payment scoping survey tool maps your organization's payment flows, segmenting them in two ways your digital payments, the payments that you're making currently digitally, and then your cash and check payments, so the payments that you're making via cash or check. And it also segments them by operational payments, so those that you're using in your internal operations, and programmatic payments, so those that you're using in your programming. Uh, then the costing utility analysis tool helps you assign costs to each of those flows in both financial and non-financial terms. So for example, I think it's helpful to have examples sometimes. There could be physical security risks associated with cash distribution for both you as a distributor and for payees in insecure areas. But there might also be financial implications to that physical insecurity, which would be hiring security guards and so on and so forth. So there can be non-financial and financial costs uh, to each of these. Uh, but the overall outcome, what you get out of these tools is a complete cost analysis of the transition to digital payments and kind of where that break-even point is. Uh, next slide. So why is mapping your payment flows important? It makes the cash flow clear for your digital payment provider. So for example, if you're paying beneficiaries, you might have a large number of small payments two days a quarter to mobile money accounts. Or on the operational side, you might have a large payment twice a year to a vendor that already has a local bank account but who still demands a paper check for record keeping. So those are two kind of very different scenarios and mapping can reveal which of your payment streams are ripe for digitization. Uh, it allows for an analysis of the real costs associated with cash transactions and allows for an assessment of potential payment flow inefficiencies. So for example, it gets you thinking about the costs of staff and beneficiary time involved in a cash distribution and how that might be much, much more quicker and much more efficient with the digital payment. So as you might imagine, kind of coming a little bit to drawbacks now, as you might imagine your own staff or your local partner staff may have some concerns about this whole digitizing process. So if you're not in East Africa, that was a total joke, uh, your staff might need additional training since you're introducing a new system of payment. So there might be some new training involved getting your staff accustomed to how these things work. Um, they also might be concerned that their job is being made redundant by a more efficient digital payment system, or there might be concerns about mapping your payment authorization process to the new system. But on the, on the brighter side, so we, we do have some lessons learned from USAID implementing partners that have made the transition to fully digital. We'll cover some of those now. So costs are not always obvious. So some financial service providers. So sometimes when you're connecting to these and talking to these providers, there might be hidden costs or non-transparent fee structures. So it's really good to kind of go through and really understand as best as you can what those costs might be. There might be an initial increase in costs, uh, but for the most part, they bear out over the long run. For example, you might need to integrate your ERP and accounting system with your financial service providers. Uh, and additionally, in programmatic settings, as Shelley will discuss later, you may need to deliver digital and financial literacy training to your payees and so on. So getting your payees 
uh, in a position where they have the digital literacy, where they have the financial literacy to be able to take on and accept those digital payments. Finally, in terms of, okay, well, how much of this can I bill or not bill to USAID? You know, how does that all work? The best way, of course, is always to, before you do any of these steps, have a discussion with your USAID agreement officer or contracting officer about the costs and about what steps you're planning to take to make sure that they are reasonable, both in your estimation and their estimation, and that you'll get approved for uh, reimbursement. Uh, and with that, I think we'll go to the next slide, which I believe is over to Craig. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll speak a little bit about some of the things that uh, we see when working with our, our partners. So uh, thank you, Tala, for that, um, uh, that overview of step three. Uh, we clearly uh, try and work with our uh, partners in a way where we want them to fully embrace <clears throat> digital payments throughout their organization to the fullest extent possible. And um, as Tala has uh, implied, Sometimes this is really difficult uh, with the partners. Their, their financial literacy is not uh, where we might hope it is. Um, they are going to be set to some degree in their ways. Many of them simply like to sign every check and see the cash in their hands. Uh, the tools that they use may not be very sophisticated and their business processes uh, oftentimes get in the way. Uh, so it, it, is, it is a journey to convert uh, some of the local partners that we work with to a, a more digital uh, uh, mindset uh, and, and again, adoption of the business practices that, uh, that undermine it. Um, so what do we do? How is it that we approach this? Well, first, uh, we start with a team, our own team. Uh, we look to hire uh, people in our local offices uh, that are involved in rolling out such programs with experience in uh, the use of digital payment technologies. Um, uh, we also uh, team from other uh, groups from around the world. Um, we have lots of projects globally where we've fully implemented these types of programs and we get pretty aggressive about leveraging those local experts to help uh, uh, cross border uh, where we can. We also have groups within our headquarters and regional staff that are pretty savvy at uh, introducing and supporting the introduction of, uh, of digital platforms with partners. We also look to bring in uh, the right um, service providers, whether it's a bank or uh, mobile carriers. We find that uh, these organizations that have fully embraced digital technologies, not just currently, but into the future and have a real commitment to it, can be key advocates working with your partners to fully embrace uh, the, the concepts and the methodologies associated with, with digital payments. Um, all of that said, though, um, uh, our efforts fall on deaf ears if we can't work with the providers to get them, or I'm sorry, the partners rather, to get them to understand how digital payments help their business. That's really the thing that they're looking for is help me translate uh, all of this new technology to how it helps me run my operation. And there we stress uh, cash flow, security, reduction of risk, improved controls, uh, uh, leveraging value-added services at some of the service providers that can provide, which is more fully described in section 10 of the toolkit. All of these things help the, the partners save money and be more efficient. And we look to our service providers to help articulate that uh, and be an advocate. Um, as Tala said, the costing utility analysis tool that's in the toolkit is a terrific resource and one that um, I certainly advocate uh, all of us using uh, to identify some of these issues and establish uh, methods to, to address them fully with the partners. Uh, we do, as I said earlier, uh, keep in mind that uh, being fully aligned with USAID's objectives here of building uh, sustainable um, uh, methods and practices throughout is important and this notion of digital by default is also an important message to our partners. We're assuming that they would like to continue working with USAID after our program is over. 
Uh, and we really try and stress that having them adopt these practices now position them not just to be successful on our project, but well beyond that. Uh, and we find that they see value long-term in embracing uh, these methods um, because of that. They want to run a good, sustainable, longer-term uh, business. Um, when considering payment stream mapping, collaboration is key. We want to make it interactive. Uh, we want to make sure that we're understanding where the gaps exist. And um, you know, really, in, in summary, the, the things that we do and the recommendations that, um, that I have is make sure that you hire well, make sure that we partner well, and that the service providers uh, we're bringing on board truly have a long-term view of where digital uh, payment technologies are now, but also where they're going into the future and committed to that. Uh, and both internally and with the service providers, make sure that they understand that this is a team sport. Uh, working collaboratively amongst all of, uh, uh, all of these folks to work with the local partners and get them to understand the benefits of this really takes uh, a, a full, full on effort. We also set standards and expectations with the local partners early uh, in the agreements that we have with them in our early conversations with them as being a partner within the program. We set a standard that the expectation is that they're embracing digital technologies to the best of, uh, of their abilities. And then lastly, make sure that you're planning to over communicate and oversell, uh, which is something that you'll see throughout the rest of the presentation is communicate, communicate, communicate what we're trying to do and the value of it is really key. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Tala who will take us through the next step. Great, and if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So I'm going to discuss um, step six of the toolkit update, which addresses some of the common challenges faced by development organizations as they are going through this digitization process. So step six has two tools. The first offers examples of common challenges and provides associated mitigating solutions. The second tool helps organizations anticipate the problems you may face in digitization. And this is primarily through um, a survey that you can conduct with your payees and staff in the geographies of focus. So we believe that this step is really most applicable for program and finance staff who are likely in the best position to mitigate challenges that may arise in this context. And Madeline, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So today I'm going to go over a few of the common challenges. So the first is low phone penetration amongst your payees. Now, while mobile phone penetration is an astounding 90% in developing countries, there are still people, especially more vulnerable populations, such as those that are forcibly displaced or living at the last mile, that may not have a mobile phone. Rather than distributing phones for free, uh, development partners could explore offering a payment plan to their beneficiaries, whether in partnership with the service provider or from their own portfolio. And that payment plan should obviously have a focus on digital repayments. So this actually recently happened and was piloted in Malawi with TNM, a mobile money operator, and they offered a three month digital payment plan to women smallholder farmers that were going to be paid for their crops digitally. Now these digital repayments serve to not only offer a convenient form of microfinance for these women to purchase a phone, but secondly, it also built their digital repayment and credit history, which could be used to access certain types of value added services like additional forms of microcredit in the future. So the next problem I want to discuss is liquidity, which as I'm sure most of you know, is a big one. Um, and it's one of the most persistent issues for mobile money operators around the world, especially those that service the last mile or hard to reach areas. So liquidity is the availability of either e-money or physical cash at an agent point, big branch or ATM or really anywhere where you're trying to process a transaction. In areas where liquidity rebalancing points are limited, it is very likely that an agent only has a restricted amount of float to transact in the day. So if you're working in a remote area um, and, and you're trying to implement digital payments and you know that your beneficiaries need to cash out at an agent point, what is the solution? Uh, so the first and most important is to communicate the anticipated cash volumes to your service provider in advance. And this is something that could actually be included in your RFP um, and also included in your service provider agreement. 
Another option is to identify, and this one is, is one that requires more active collaboration with your service provider, um, is to identify the businesses within the geographies of focus that you're going to be issuing the digital payments that have high cash flow. So typically this is something like filling station or shops that have um, a really high traffic. So in partnership with your service provider, again, um, incentives could be provided for these businesses to serve as liquidity dealers, like offering startup capital or loans. It's also important to note here that liquidity is really stressed by a lack of digital payment acceptance points, right? Which leave your beneficiaries no option but to cash out if they're living in, in a cash-based economy. So this overwhelms agents and quickly exhausts their float. Um, but by identifying the areas where your payees are making their primary financial transactions, and again, re this requires active collaboration with your service provider, um, but you can work with your service provider to increase merchant acceptance of digital payments, uh, which will bolster the digital payment ecosystem and, of course, help ensure sustainability after the project ends. So another of the, the key issues that you may face, especially if you are working with more vulnerable populations, may be a lack of identification to meet KYC requirements. Unfortunately, there is little influence often that development partners have in mitigating this issue, but it could be addressed by selecting a digital payment product with minimal KYC requirements. So a lot of digital payment providers uh, and including some banks are now offering um, low KYC digital wallets that can actually be opened remotely with just a phone number. So that's something to explore if you're dealing with a population that has issues around uh, formal identification. And some of the other issues we include in the toolkit, such as the risk of fraud, digital illiteracy, financial illiteracy, or low pay willingness to receive digital payments can all be mitigated with a robust digital financial literacy training, which Shelley will discuss next. But before she gets there, I want to uh, hand it back over to Craig to again offer some practical examples from the implementing partner perspective. So Craig, over to you. Great. Thank you, Tala. <clears throat> so yes, uh, we, we run into uh, all kinds of problems when we're implementing uh, these programs. And um, I think it is, is safe for us to say that we can't assume the obvious. Even some of the most basic assumptions invariably will not be correct. Uh, things as simple as electronic bank-to-bank -bank transfers don't even work in all countries uh, as seamlessly as you, you think that they might. Uh, and there's great variability country to country uh, and certainly tremendous variability within a country from, from region to region. The differences that we see when we look at large cities, uh, towns, uh, rural locations with, within a country uh, vary tremendously. And the planning uh, that needs to be um, implemented to assess those different uh, situations uh, needs to be well thought out. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later on uh, in the session. Um, uh, as uh, Tala said, one of the most significant problems that we've run across in quite a few of our countries is this point of liquidity. Uh, there are some instances where we've spent a tremendous amount of time and energy orchestrating mobile money solutions, collecting the data we need, getting our people trained, working with um, uh, those that are developing policies and procedures to have the proper controls and alike, only to find that when we show up to do, let's say a training session, the um, uh, local uh, mobile money provider doesn't have enough funding to cover the transactions that we need to cover. Uh, so uh, making sure that we're communicating with those organizations um, in slightly different ways where we're orchestrating things in advance becomes uh, an imperative. Um, digital literacy, safety and security all tied together as well. And, and this is something that we found with many of the participants uh, in the programs that we operate is that they're a little scared because quite frankly, uh, these types of transactions that we're getting them to embrace are something new. Uh, so we have to find our way around educating some people somewhat even on the fly. Uh, and certainly uh, some of the infrastructure, the internet connectivity, some of the social issues associated with uh, you know, bank account 
uh, ownership and access obviously also get in the way. So the things that we try and keep in mind here is keeping our options open. Uh, it's not one size fits all. So while electronic transfers might be an elegant solution in a lot of circumstances, uh, we find that uh, moving towards mobile money or things like prepaid um, uh, cards are, are also effective. Uh, and we find that the more options that we explore and have available to us, the more effective we're going to be ultimately in, in uh, solving a problem. Communicating with all of the service providers, letting them know uh, what we're doing, uh, where and when we'll be, making sure that we're trying to get out in front of this liquidity issue um, is something that we've had a lot of success with. But uh, it does require us to communicate with those providers in ways that otherwise you might not think you need to, uh, especially when you're overlaying uh, you know, uh, concepts and, and standards that uh, are, are day to day in the developed world. Um, working with non traditional service providers can also uh, assist. We find uh, that we run into, uh, again, liquidity problems. Talking uh, to uh, those that are helping out, uh, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a conference center, whether it's a meeting coordinator, some of these organizations may in fact help solve the problem. Uh, and uh, we've been pleasantly surprised uh, when we present these issues to some of these non-traditional service providers that they've actually been able to help us solve a problem. They want the business too, and uh, they'd hate to lose a piece of business simply because they can't help us or we can't uh, figure out how to make money available at the point uh, where uh, the cash is going to be uh, needed. Um, uh, working with people who are less familiar with the technologies I mentioned a minute ago um, can be a problem, but we find being explicit, making sure that we're coaching them around things like security, uh, how to turn digital into cash uh, and use the digital currency, if you will, that we're uh, using to, to cover their expenses is something that people may need some assistance with. So we try to be very explicit around, again, how they secure uh, the digital uh, payments that we've made to them, but then also how they can, can use them. We try and make it as easy on those participants as we possibly can, because we, again, we come from a space realizing that their, their literacy, their financial and digital currency literacy may be quite low. Um, and then um, lastly, uh, I'd like to put a, a plug in again for the common challenges and solutions worksheets that you'll see here in the, the toolkit. This is an excellent guide that should be used that uh, clearly identifies and articulates some of the challenges that you'll see on the ground and provides some ideas on how to resolve the issues. And then similarly, the common challenge identifier that's in the toolkit is an immensely useful tool that uh, I think you'll, you'll really find great value in. Uh, and I would encourage you all to take a hard look at that as well. These, these two documents are crafted to represent real world situations. And they offer proven methods to address the issues you're going to face. So with that, uh, we'd like to conduct our first poll question for everyone. Great. Um, thanks, Craig. And as people can see, our poll is going to take us to the next step where we talk about digital financial literacy. Um, first of all, while we're doing the poll, I just wanted to do a shout out to NetHope for revamping this toolkit. It has been an honor for me to be involved in both of them and to close out nine years of work with NetHope and its members creating this updated tool. And I'm so gratified to hear Craig say that it's useful and relevant. And I would also point out, 
that Craig is from MSH, which does health work. So I think his participation and encouragement for the importance of this tool shows that cross-sector digital payments has become something that's important. So we see in the poll that 80% believe that digital financial literacy is a barrier to using digital payments. Thanks, Madeline. Um, so on the next slide, you'll see that we've included a step for that very reason that looks at digital financial literacy. So as we progressed along the journey of mobile money and digital payments over the years, this is one of those hard nuts to crack that continues to be a problem. And Craig was mentioning that there might be some fear about the use of digital financial services, and there might be some discomfort and a, an issue around trust. So the good news is that for organizations that care about populations that you're working with, that tend to be the poor and the vulnerable, you can be that bridge to building the digital capacity and how to use tools, um, financial tools that run on a digital platform. I would just point out that that has never been more important than now as we sit with COVID-19 throughout the globe. Um, and unfortunately, the highest death rate here in the US today or even last night. Um, so people are having to socially distance and we saw a lot of governments really pushing digital in a very aggressive way as a result of that. So if we want inclusive digital economies, which is where the world is going, we need everyone to be able to be able to use those technologies and have a comfort with that. So step seven is a tool that is really designed to help you be that bridge builder. And Craig mentioned that MSH is doing that, um, working to build that capacity with people who participate in their programs. So there are a couple of things that we're trying to do in this tool. And I also wanted to um, just shout out to Talent and the team for how they structured this tool and all of the tools. You'll see that there's some great guides that you find on the first page of each tool, including who might use the tool, uh, this particular tool, budget times, and then how much time it takes you to read it, because uh, we all feel short on time these days. So in this step, what we're basically looking at and helping you do is build a curriculum so you can incorporate digital financial literacy in your distribution and your digital disbursements. And we give a sample digital training flow that you can use as well. And then importantly, to look in, in tool three at how that went and what you were hearing from feedback. So if we could look at the next slide, Madeline. So what do we mean first by digital financial literacy? And I think this is important because there's some recent evidence that digital literacy, just knowing how to use a mobile phone is not enough. Um, her, the HER project, which is based in Bangladesh and works with garment factory workers, found that if women had, and they were looking at women, had comfort using a mobile phone, it didn't necessarily translate into them using financial services on that phone. So we've seen people do a lot of work on digital literacy. We've seen people do a lot of work on financial literacy. How do we budget? How do we access credit? How do we think about savings or formal financial services? But when you look at the intersection of the two, there's less uh, that has been done and it's increasingly important that the work focus there. So in this tool, you can see a diagram that was created by FinEquity, which is a community of practice at CGAP that focuses on women's financial inclusion. And this was curated from a member conversation about what are the important eco and ecosystem and enabling factors for building digital financial literacy. And CGAP defines digital financial literacy as the application of digital and financial literacy, as you can see, to enable the use of digital financial services. So bringing those two together and doing it in a very practical way so people not only bridge the comfort to using a mobile phone, but they bridge the comfort from using it possibly for WhatsApp, Facebook calls and texting to using it as a way to access their financial account. I'm also proud to say that with USAID, we've also recently launched um, amidst COVID a IVR based campaign that focuses on women. It's called Hey Sister, Show Me the Mobile Money. And it's currently running in three countries, Ghana, Malawi, and Uganda. And the focus of the campaign is 10 quick lessons to build women's digital financial literacy and capacity to evaluate products. 
So the, the curriculum is available online and you can actually download the audio files. We also have the scripts so it can be used in other countries. And then we also have a facilitator's guide, recognizing that just pushing out digital literacy through a channel, maybe through text or other things is not enough. As Craig said, who you hire and how you oversell and building that comfort still needs to have a human interface. So how are we doing that in our programming? So there's a couple of good resources. And also in the tool, we mentioned that you should look at what is already available. So we found in doing our re research for the Hey Sister campaign, there was some curriculum out there, but a lot of it was not public. So are there resources you can use? And you can look at the toolkit and beyond Hey Sister, there's GSMA and others who have published some great um, work that you can start to build your campaign with. So don't overlook this step. And again, this is, as Tala mentioned, an important step to bridging to the long-term long use of digital financial services beyond you sending a payment to a person, but them making it part of their financial life. Um, then I'm gonna look at the next step so Madeline, the next slide, step eight. Uh, so step eight is, uh, Craig really touched on this very well. It's about testing and evaluating. So if your program is new, even if you followed Craig's advice, which I loved and hired the right staff, you need to figure out if the service provider you selected and the payment process is going to work. So instead of saying issued my RFP, made my choice, let's go, let's issue all our payments this way, we really recommend that you start by testing it internally. And then once you test it internally with your staff and get the feedback that it was working and troubleshoot any issues, you pilot it with a small group. So one of the values of this toolkit, it really is designed for you to take it and use it. So we've included two tools with this. One is a digital payments test checklist. What do you have set up to make sure when you do the test, you're looking for these things? And then the second thing is a very quick feedback questionnaire. So people can tell you, okay, I found it easy to access. Whoops, I went to the agent, there was no liquidity. And then you can use that to inform the broader rollout. I will also say that this is one of the steps that has a tutorial which is great. Uh, so the video tutorials follow a case study. And in this step, it looks at how you do that, um, starting with your internal staff's payments and then working to a pilot. So we hope you also find those tutorials, which are a new feature here, will be helpful to be able to figure out how to use this tool. Um, next slide. Again, here is, we're trying to be helpful here. So this is a timeline we put out. We suggested that you test two months before issuing payments. So this could be with your staff and you conduct a second staff trial to make sure that you've adjusted based on the feedback you got from trial one. And then a month before you move to a small subset of payees and test because you might have regional differences. Some people might have different styles of phones, feature phones versus smartphones you test it with that smaller subset before doing the further rollout. So with that, I'll hand it over to Craig who will give us some more practical advice. Thanks, Shelley. Um, <clears throat> so certainly testing and evaluation is a very critical part of, of rolling out um, what you wanna do and what you can do within a, a given um, situation and, and the the geography, the environmentals uh, impact your ability to implement certain types of programs. Financial literacy, as Shelley just uh, discussed, also have a way of impacting what you can and cannot do. And all these things get borne out as you uh, test and evaluate and course correct throughout uh, this step in the process. Um, you, we cannot assume that all of these different features and, and functions work the same in every country or even with a, in every region of the country. Um, and what that means is that you've got to be flexible to uh, deploy different methodologies uh, within your operation to truly embrace uh, the proper digital payment technology for the situation that's in hand. And that also means that you're going to have to course correct around things like your own business controls, your own 
uh, policies and procedures and, and alike. And that will definitely take some time and energy, but is well worth it uh, in the long run. Um, but certainly something that needs to be well thought through um, and, and executed against. What you'll find uh, is absolutely all over the map. Um, and we have certainly seen instances, uh, as I said earlier, where within one country, one bank might be quite adept at uh, providing certain circumstances, but on the receiving end, uh, a different bank uh, might not have the ability even to process a, a simple receipt of a payment electronically. Um, we've also seen instances where uh, standard practices within MSH where headquarters wants to have oversight to certain types of transactions are simply barred uh, by a country statute where uh, you can't electronically get access to a bank account from overseas. And we've had to adopt policies and procedures to make sure that we're, we're adequately providing controls and oversight, yet changing our internal practices. And, and you all will, will see the same thing. Um, Testing, uh, again, helps uncover all of those types of issues and allows you to consider alternative approaches. Um, we like to test the processes end to end and in di different circumstances, different geographies, uh, you know, different uh, social climates. We try and look at as many different situations that we'll run into as possible and we try and deploy the best technology that we can given the limitations that we face. So please make sure that we're not testing just a part of the process. Test end to end as best as you uh, possibly can. Look at the various scenarios. M mobile money might be a good solution in, in one situation, but prepay cards might be a, a better solution than others. Be flexible, adapt uh, the methodologies you can use to the situations that you run into. Shelly mentioned this, and I can't overemphasize this point as well. Don't be afraid to start slowly. This is a long run, not a sprint. Look for small wins, build momentum within your teams, build your team skill set, build momentum with your partners. Getting small wins along the way helps do that. And if all else fails, get as close to the last mile as you absolutely can. Um, uh, the technology will change over time. And the more you continue to push and get as close to the last mile as possible, the better you'll be prepared ultimately to, to close the last mile when the technology and, and the skill sets catch up. Um, so with that, good testing and evaluation will position you for success when you do the full scale rollout, which is discussed in section nine in the toolkit including the definition of key performance indicators, which um, I recommend you take a hard look at. And then similarly, another area where you should really focus is um, on data security, which is covered in section 10 of the toolkit, which also is vitally important uh, in, in the world that we live in today. So with that, uh, we'll do a second poll. Uh, so we'll do poll number two. Great, thanks, Craig. So, so this poll is asking you, would you apply this toolkit in your work? And it should have just appeared on your screen. We'll give you a few, few moments to answer. Great, and Madeline, maybe we can show the results now. Okay, so 61% yes, 0% no's, that's great to hear, and 39% maybe. So it would be interesting for some of the people that indicated maybe if you wanted to share, you know, your reasons for that in, in the poll um, as we move on to the question and answer session. So we have two great questions, both from Stephen Chu. I know um, Taha had an opportunity to address them in the chat, but I also think it's helpful to, to address them here as well. So 
Taha, I'm going to hand um, this one to you first, and then if the other panelists want to comment, uh, please feel free. So it's, does this new living toolkit provide a list of vetted local slash regional slash global payment providers with experience working with um, certain implementing partners? Yeah, thanks, Tala, and thanks, Stephen, for asking that question. It's a great question. Uh, and one that we've also thought about. And we, we found that one of the best ways of kind of addressing that potentially is with, um, as I mentioned in the chat, communities of practice to really allow implementing partners uh, to learn from each other on the basis of their experiences uh, and also share kind of lessons learned. Uh, and in fact, in, in our uh, landscaping assessment, that's where, we, where USAID went out and talked to you know, over 122 implementing partner staff, we're hearing a lot of kind of echoes of those lessons learned of how they resolved common issues or, uh, and of course, look for that uh, early next year. Um, we, it, you know, with the state of digital payments and digital payment providers being so dynamic and regulations changing and regulations um, and experiences being so country specific and sometimes even, you know, within a country, sub country specific, uh, it would be hard for us to come up with an approved list. Um, but one of the things I would say is that you could potentially, implementing partners can look at that, look at managing their risk, for example, in the same way that they look at managing risks with other kind of vendors of other services. And I would kind of look for, again, look for really high data protection standards, look for really high um, service provision, look for responsiveness to uh, customer needs and customer demands and having a kind of a user centric both you, the implementing partner, as kind of a customer of the financial service provider, but also uh, responses to payee needs and, res and how responsive they could be to adjusting kind of their business model to address some of those needs. Um, so that's kind of, you know, maybe where I would end it here, but um, it's, it's an excellent question and one that we've thought a lot about. And again, just to kind of cite the Rwanda case, in Rwanda, our USAID country team has facilitated these um, kind of regular conversations between finance managers uh, of implementing partners to kind of discuss again, kind of common challenges, common solutions, uh, and what approaches people might be taking to kind of address them uh, over. Uh, Charlie, I just wanted to add one thing. So one of the other things we updated that we did also in 2014 is something called the market viability tool. So while it's not going to give you providers per se, and Tala, you can tell us what step it's included with, it was at USAID's request to look at um, external data and rate the markets for viability for mobile money and digital payment. So that's a tool you could look at and it will reference you to other sources where you might be able to get deeper at the service provider level. So just wanted to mention that and uh, shout out to Hamilton McNutt, who's been my partner in this work for nine years, who did the Rwanda work and is also uh, on the call with us today. Great, thanks Shelly. Yeah, and that tool is actually in step two, um, the market viability tool. Okay, great. So we just got a question in. Um, interesting that you mentioned last mile. Just wondering if you would prefer to build a digital platform yourself or partner with local partners in every country. So Craig, as, as the implementing partner on here, I might toss this question to you. Certainly. Um, uh, we always leverage local presence. And uh, you know, for us, what that means is that we're usually working with very large international banking partners to start with. And then likewise, we're using uh, a lot of the mobile carriers that also have a larger international presence and a real uh, focus in this area. And uh, we find that they're much more adept at understanding what's going on in the local market, not just today, but also pressing the markets well into the future beyond when MSH may even have a presence in that market. So we know that they're gonna be there for an, a long sustained period of time. And we find that leveraging uh, you know, their capabilities and skill sets and their permanence is, uh, is in our usual best interest. Thanks, Craig. 
and we have another question, Taha, that seems best suited for you. So as USAID moves us forward with digitization, how should implementing partners or USAID assess how payment providers may use the historical payment information of local communities? Yeah, thanks, Tala. That was another great question from uh, from Stephen. And, you know, we, we take that uh, idea of data protection and, and data privacy, you know, very seriously at USAID. Um, and there's a number of resources that I put in the chat that kind of help assess uh, and help, you know, there, there's essentially a two-step process, right? One is when you are selecting your service provider, when you are selecting your financial service provider, kind of assessing what data protections and what data privacy standards are they meeting and, and do they have in place? Uh, and then secondarily, of course, kind of talking with them and, and you yourself, kind of having your own data protections and data privacy standards in place to make sure that you're being very careful with how you manage beneficiary uh, beneficiary data to make sure that uh, you're putting up those firewall, firewalls against uh, commercialization or you're obtaining consent from uh, your payees in terms of how their uh, data will be used uh, or, you know, and or sold. Uh, you know, of course, it's, you know, this is a very complex question because in certain cases, uh, there are cases where the sharing of data can benefit uh, beneficiaries, right? So if, uh, you know, for example, if they, if, if by sharing a beneficiary's data, uh, they, you can kind of build on additional services that would benefit them, then that could be a good use and a good sharing of data. But of course, consent is always necessary and kind of advising them that, okay, this is how we will or will not be using your data. So I think uh, there are benefits to kind of the connectedness and to sharing of data, but there also needs to be consent and there also needs to be awareness. And of course, that a lot of this goes back to, you know, what Shelly was talking about, about digital literacy training and financial literacy training is having beneficiaries really understand, okay, when I'm providing this data to you, how will that data be used and make sure that they're comfortable with, with that outcome. And just like my final note on this is that there's been uh, recent studies by CGAP and others showing that even during COVID, even last mile beneficiaries are concerned with their data privacy and data protection. It's not just this, you know, and they're willing to pay more actually is what the study showed, which was like, you know, a super interesting finding and something that uh, is worth looking into and keeping in mind as we think about these topics. Over. Thanks, Taha. Um, and we had a, a question from Stella. Were service providers part of the process of building the new live toolkit? They are a useful source of local on the ground information, um, challenges, solutions, opportunities. It will be great partners in this process and also in the digital uh, financial literacy process. So I'll, I'll take this one, Stella. Absolutely. Um, so digital uh, payment service providers were consulted you know, for every, every step and tool to make sure that it is relevant um, for, for their context as well. And as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, this toolkit is really, is really supporting active collaboration with digital payment service providers. You know, often development partners are working in hard to reach last mile areas where the digital payment ecosystem is just not there. It's not, or it, it might be there, but it might not be robust enough to support the sustainable, um, the sustainable use of digital payments, even for the program purposes and beyond. So, so this toolkit is very much um, supporting active collaboration with the dig digital payment service provider if you're in, in a more challenging market. Um, I think we have one minute left. Let me see. Craig, if you can answer a question in maybe 30 seconds, there's how, from Stephen, how do you manage and even negotiate the agendas, priorities of your global financial institution partners as you also promote local MNOs as you need oh, both at the table? What a great question that is. Uh, so yes, we, we see this, but in, in most all cases, especially the larger players realize that there are synergies amongst them. And many of the banks that we're negotiating with have active agreements with all the major um, mobile network operators. Uh, so um, they realize that there, there's connective tissue amongst all of them. And the mobile network operators simply have the capacity to provide a service level that the banks don't, the number of kiosks that they have across the country, the number of subscribers that they have, 
uh, clearly outweigh the number of branches that a bank might have or the number of um, even bank accounts that the, the banks may, may have with individuals. So the use of the, the mobile technology is, is far more prevalent. So we realize uh, or have come to realize that the banks oftentimes will very much stay out of the way of the mobile network operators yet leverage their capability across the countries. And, and maybe the last point is that insofar as that's the case, we look to work with banks that have relationships with many mobile operators so we can use as many of those uh, remote uh, uh, cash points as we possibly can throughout their, their collective networks. It's a very important question to ask the banks when you're working with them. Great, thank you so much, everyone. So I wanted to thank you all uh, for listening in today for your time and attention. And as mentioned earlier, the toolkit will be uploaded to the NetHope Solutions Center later today. And the link to that toolkit will also be provided in the webinar recording that is sent to your email. So you can, I saw Stella, uh, a question um, about who to reach out to. Please feel free to connect with all of us on LinkedIn. We'll be happy to answer any further questions you have about the toolkit. So wishing you all a happy holiday season and, and hopefully a healthier 2021. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Tala. And thank you to all of our presenters and the audience for your attendance today. Please do look out for the uh, follow-up email that will be sent to you later today. It will include a link to the recording and the other, other collateral from today's session. Also, please take a moment to fill out our satisfaction poll. We would appreciate your feedback. It helps us make these sessions better and better all the time. Um, and again, happy holidays to everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.